boy. And we think the reason for that is so she so she would keep her pee out of her cage. Oh. You know, she was in a cage. Mm -hmm. Maybe she didn't like her cellmate. <laughs> yeah, that could be. <laughs> she had several of them for 54 pumps. <laughs> And she had good aim. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she, she's really a good dog. She's she just got to learn how to be a dog. Sad. This is a nice video on hamburgers, Dan. Yeah, thank you. Oh, jeez. How are you going to keep up with fries? <laughs> <laughs> Question for Zach. I don't know. <laughs> I saw the cheese stuck to the top of the lid. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, our our fault on that. We, you can make like the lid like as a big of a gap as you want. We just didn't raise it enough, but it was pretty good. No upcharge for a fly, huh? <laughs> no, not at all. It's not protein. You. Yeah, it's protein. <laughs> you waiting on Mr. Uh, Gillig? I'm not sure unless he's on under one of the two Nick Dutro accounts potentially. So. Maybe. I just don't know which one. He's doing the meeting here from City Hall. Um, I guess I'm just going to have to promote them both quick, the panelists, and see which one he is and go from there. It's the real Nick. So I'm going to guess it's the other one that is maybe Ben Gillig. It's the stunt Nick. <laughs> it may be the other one, or he's logging in currently. Okay. Maybe it's Nick Jr. Hey, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> got the junior. <laughs> Get a little glare from the top. <laughs> oh. Because he's so high up, it looks like he's mm -hmm. uh, on a helicopter, or maybe he's maybe he's in the Goodyear Blunt broadcasting live over Tiffin. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely afraid of heights, Mr. Mayor. So am I. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order our committee of the whole meeting for the May 2nd regularly scheduled city council meeting. Do we have any suspensions this evening, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Uh, um, President. Ordinance 2238. Um, which is the ordinance for the uh, water bill um, at City Hall. Uh, the reason for this, we budgeted correctly. Unfortunately, we had a water leak um, that has been since fixed, but because of that, we are going to require additional uh, um, money in that budget line. So ordinance 2238 uh, to amend um, budget ordinance 2105 uh, we would prefer that be passed tonight so that we can continue to uh, ensure that the water bill is paid timely and correctly. Very good. That's Thank it. you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if I could ask a member of the Finance Committee uh, to motion for that suspension this evening, I did sign that into uh, onto our ordinance. Um, it's always the little things that seem to do the most damage. Uh, it just seems to have got us on this one. Again. Councilwoman Iannatuno. Perfect. I can do it. Thank you very much. There is uh, one additional item I did want to bring up uh, just uh, as a, something I noticed today, and this could be as simple, uh, you know, knowing Matt Watson, he would have a 
full, thorough, lengthy report ready in, in seconds. Um, but with all the neat development that Heidelberg has done uh, off of the Main Street, I have noticed it's a little bit difficult when you're coming down hedges. It's a bit hard to see uh, to turn left uh, just because there's almost always a very, very solid line of, of cars that are parked, which is, which is a great problem to have. But um, it'd be nice to, to kind of maybe see if there's any remedies we could, we could look at for that. Or if it's just something that I'm, that, uh, is just something I'm noticing. While we do have the uh, city administrator here, that could be an item for uh, the traffic safety committee to look at at their next meeting. I know they just met last week, so it's going to be a bit, but uh, um, Dale, that's probably the best group to discuss that with since Matt and our police and fire officials and, and the street department are all there. Yeah, I, I think that would be, ideal uh, and I don't think it's a pressing issue just something for long-term planning purposes yeah we'll look at the line of sight there and see if there's anything that can be done thank you Dale uh, councilman Perkins on you Zach was that hedges in Maine yes sir hedges in okay Maine. Yeah, yeah it's horrible <laughs> I take it every morning I can't see, even in the Jeep, I still can't see over the cars. So, and you know, it's my own fault because I could very easily just go down to circular, but. Yeah, me too, know, but <laughs> sometimes I don't. I'm, sometimes I'm a very lazy man. Councilman Leopard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't want to take anybody by surprise, but uh, this evening I will ask for the resolution 22-16 be read in its entirety tonight. I think that is a wonderful idea, Councilman Leopard. Thank you. And on that, um, um, that is a one reading resolution. Did any of you good folks happen to see uh, the Tiffin City Schools Arts and Music Festival? a couple weekends ago or maybe two weeks ago. It was pretty special. We've got a lot of talent. You know, but it was mind boggling the cool things that those kids created. Does anyone have anything else for the committee of the whole meeting? Seeing no hands, we will call the committee of the whole to a close at 6.53 p.m.
Um, Councilman Gillick, do you have a suit coat on? I do, but you should know I'm wearing basketball shorts. Oh, I didn't know tonight was dress up night. I didn't get the memo, so I thought I'd ask. <laughs> am I? Am I? Oh, you're going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, aren't you? Well, certainly, but you know, strategically stand. <laughs> Dale, is that your inner sanctum we see behind you? That's one corner of my den. Oh, wow. Looks like heaven. Bunch of collected materials over the years. Well, that looks like the books that Ben just bought at the public library. The Yard sale, what do they call it? Friends of library sale? Friends no. of the library, yeah. Nine nine bags full. At a dollar a piece? Let me count the way. Uh, it, nine was, uh, it was $5 or $3 to fill a bag or $2 to fill a bag, but I bought the bought a whole bunch of the reusable bags. Aaron mostly just shakes her head at this point. <laughs> I've, you know, we were on a Zoom call, Dale and I and Aaron the other day, and there was a gentleman with a full suit of armor in his uh, in his office, which was which was interesting. Okay. Well, I donated some Winnie the Pooh books from uh, Virginia, the state of Virginia. And there was a little figurine and pristine. I called them uh, Winnie the Pooh books, and I thought those would bring a pretty good dollar. But when I saw a dollar a book, dollar a book, so that was my donation to the cause. Yeah, it's one of those things where. You know, you, you have to find the right market. Uh, Audrey Flood's a, a really good person to talk to about book value. Uh, she and her mom are, are pretty hardened collectors. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where what you have isn't really worth anything until somebody wants to buy it. You made a, a good comment. My son, Bill Jones, being the auctioneer. Oh, yeah. Small, what do you think this is worth? What do you think this is worth? And over and over, he says, whatever someone will pay for it. No, no, I bought this for $500. What's it worth? Whatever someone will pay for it. That's the answer, Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tell the kids that I've got some of my uh, uh, Tiffin Brewery bottles at, at school. And, you know, the kids asked me what I paid for one of them. I said, well, you know, Paid $125, but I was definitely the guy at the end of the rainbow on that one. You know, <laughs> there's, there's not another soul on this planet that would probably pay that much. It's a really cool bottle. You brought one of those uh, on the history tour, didn't you? Did, yeah, yeah. You gave, you gave somebody, what'd you give? Uh... Oh, that was, that was one of the $8 Hoo Bah bottles. Okay, I was going to say, hopefully it wasn't anywhere. that $125 one. No, gosh, no. no. <laughs> You've been bad, Councilman Gillig. I see you have a partner with you. I have a what? Partner with you. Have you been bad? I have a partner. You have, you have a police officer in your Oh, yes, yes, I do. Yeah, the chief is <laughs> watching to make sure. you take away? Yeah. Yeah, they got the white coat ready and everything. How about an ankle bracelet? <laughs> I played against a kid with an ankle bracelet in high school football. <laughs> he was a nose tackle and he was meaner than a snake. Uh, Probably yeah. only weighed a buck 65, but he was almost impossible to block. Must have been an away game for you then, huh? It was. It was yeah. <laughs> it was just down 224, if that tells you anything. Well, I know it wasn't Sunny East. It was not. Keep going. <laughs> well, we're Finley. <laughs> okay, we're about one minute away here. So we catch you by surprise, Ben, being president tonight or not? 
No, no, this was planned. Okay. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now seven o'clock. I'd like to call to order the regularly scheduled Tiffin City Council meeting for May 2nd, 2022. Our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Council Member Iana Tuno. Thank you, Mr. President. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to do our very best this day, not by worrying about whether we are right, but by doing the right thing. May we understand that the roots of happiness grow deepest in the soil of service. In his name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Yanatuno, for the wonderful prayer and for leading us in the pledge. I'll ask the Council Clerk for us to take the roll, please. Council Member Yanatuno. Here. Council Member Jones. Present. Council Member Leopard. Here. Council Member Perkins. Here. Council Member Perry. Present. Council Member Rhodes. Council Member Gillig. Here. Let the record show that five of the seven council members are present this evening. Uh, council President Boyle is uh, otherwise engaged with her employment responsibilities. Uh, therefore, for those watching at home, my name is Ben Gillig. I'm the president pro tem poor of city council. So I'll be presiding officer this evening. Uh, did everyone have a chance to look over the minutes from the April 18th, 2022 regular and committee of the whole meetings? Are there any additions, corrections, or otherwise? Seeing none, they will stand approved. We will go on to committee reports, starting with finance. I have no report at this time. Law and community planning, Councilman Leopard. No report, Mr. President. Thank you. Materials and equipment, Council Member Jones. No report at this time, Mr. President. Thank you. Personnel and Labor Relations, Council Member Perry. No report, Mr. President. Does anyone have a report for recreation and public property? No report, Mr. President. Thank you. Street, sidewalks, and sewers, Council Member Perkins. Yes, thank you. A street sidewalks and sewers committee meeting was held Monday, April 18th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss ordinance 22-34, easement for sanitary sewer purposes for AAI leasing LLC, and 22-35, easement for sanitary sewer and stormwater drainage purposes for RNL Zeiss Family Partnership LTD. In attendance were city engineer Matt Watson, Mayor Aaron Montz, and council members Perkins, Leopard, Perry, Jones, and Antuno. <clears throat> City engineer Matt Watson began the meeting by explaining that AAI leasing, leasing's request is for Runyon's Reserve Subdivision, which is currently being proposed through the Planning Commission and is located near the intersection of East Davis Street and Elwood Street. The sanitary sewer has been installed and most of the testing and inspection has been completed. This request is being brought forth to stay proactive on the project and keep moving forward. Council member Iantuno proceeded to ask if the subdivision would maintain their own street and or sidewalks. Engineer Watson stated that there have been no discussions for any at this time, but any private sidewalks or roads will be their responsibility to maintain. Engineer Watson then stated, Zeiss will also maintain their private road and sidewalks needed. Engineer Watson stated that RNL Zeiss Family Partnerships requested easement located on Euclid Avenue is a two part request for sanitary sewer and drainage request. This request is for the north side only and will need to, and they will need to come back to council for the south side development. He also explained that all the sanitary sewer for the entire development has been installed, tested, and inspected. The drainage easement is for the existing ditch that is located just west of the two new units. There are, there are multiple properties that already utilize this for adequate drainage. The drainage easement will be sufficient for all units in the development. Council Member Leopard then made a motion for ordinance number 22-34 and 22-35 to be introduced at the council meeting immediately following the committee meeting. The motion was seconded by Council Member Iannantuno and the motion passed five to zero. 
with no further business, committee business to discuss, the meeting adjourned at 6.10 p.m. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Council Member Perkins? Outstanding report, Council Member, very well done. And economic development and downtown planning, Council Member Iana Tuno. No report, Mr. President. Thank you. Does anyone see a need for a committee of the whole meeting? Something I would like to discuss, and I certainly don't believe it needs to be scheduled. I would love to do a committee of the whole where it's almost like an organizational meeting, maybe where we really outline where our individual strengths are and maybe we figure out a way to get that into some sort of you know organized document so folks could see you know who to call uh for for various issues um and we might know a little bit better you know uh well you know ken may know quite a bit about this um uh, for for the second ward um just kind of like a planning purposes uh but i wouldn't want to take up you know, much of a regular scheduled meeting, but sometime in the future, I, I think that would be an excellent meeting to hold for a committee of the whole. But moving on, uh, we will now head to reports of the officers, starting out with his honor, Mayor Aaron D. Montz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, for the sake of time, because I have a lot uh, this evening under my report with a lot of different folks here, um, I have two proclamations um, to read first, and then we're going to get into some presentations this evening. Uh, and I'm going to skip over most of what I, I typically would say during these reports uh, so that we can give everyone their, uh, their due time. Um, the first mayoral proclamation uh, is a proclamation for uh, Brain Tumor Awareness Month and DIPG Awareness Day. Uh, and it states, whereas nearly 6,000 children and adolescents will be diagnosed with a brain tumor in the United States in 2022, Whereas childhood cancer is the number one disease related killer of kids in the US and brain tumors are the most deadly type. Despite significant progress over the last several decades, survival rates for certain brain cancers remain perilously low. Brain cancer represents approximately 30% of total childhood cancer deaths. And whereas 200 to 400 children in the US are diagnosed with diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, DIPG every year, a brain cancer with 0% survival rate. Most of these kids will live less than a year after diagnosis of DIPG. Whereas childhood cancer is on the rise, averaging 0.7% increase per year since 1975. And whereas because of their location, some pediatric brain tumors and their required treatments can cause significant long-term impairment to intellectual and neurological function. And whereas the causes of most childhood cancers are unknown and at the present childhood cancer cannot be prevented and families who are or have been in treatment work tirelessly to change these alarming statistics. Therefore, be it resolved, I, Aaron D. Mons, Mayor of the City of Tiffin, Ohio, do hereby proclaim May 2022 in the City of Tiffin as Brain Tumor Awareness Month and May the 17th as DIPG Awareness Day. This was done on my sec this is done on the second day of May in the year of our Lord 2022. And then we do have a second proclamation this evening and it is for International Firefighters Day. It states whereas International Firefighters Day is observed each year on May 4th to honor and remember past firefighters who have lost their lives while serving their communities to express gratitude to those who have served in this line of work and to show support and appreciation for those who presently serve. Whereas regardless of the language a firefighter speaks or the country in which he or she works and resides, all firefighters fight against the same enemy, fire. And whereas firefighters allow, follow a long line of tradition and honor that inspires them to help colleagues, neighbors and strangers alike. And whereas at a moment's notice, firefighters are quick to respond to uncertain situations to mitigate danger and combat the threat of destructive fire in order to protect individuals, families, and the economic being of our community. And whereas the demands of firefighting are accompanied by both personal and physical tolls that firefighters knowingly accept while risking their lives to protect the lives of others. 
Therefore, be it resolved, I, Aaron D. Montz, Mayor of the City of Tiffin, Ohio, do hereby proclaim May 4th, 2022, in the City of Tiffin as International Firefighters Day. And I encourage all citizens to show support and appreciation to our city, county, and state firefighters who protect our lives and property so diligently throughout the year and by remembering past firefighters who dedicated their lives to preserve our safety. Done on the second day of May in the year of our Lord, 2022. Um, of course, we really wanna thank our firefighters for the jobs that they do day out, not only just in the Tiffin community, but the surrounding areas uh, with our mutual aid agreements and whatnot. So with that said, we're going to have Rob Chapel um, jump on here, the fire chief. He has some awards to give out. Um, so I am, oh, looks like Dave Pauly's going to grab him now. I can see him behind Ben. So Ben, you're almost like a puppet master with the playing the strings in that room. Uh, so I am going to have Dave Pauly uh, join us there on uh, with Ben, and I'm going to head over with him quickly uh, for the awards, and I'll see you all in just a second. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And having utilized the services of our fire and rescue division twice in 2022, I can tell you, you know, they're the real deal. Mr. Mayor. So thank you, uh, Councilman Gillig, Mayor Mons, for uh, affording us the time tonight. Uh, I'd like to welcome in firefighter paramedic Isaac Heiser. He's been with our department for a good number of years now. Isaac's a, been a great member for us. And I would like to uh, present him tonight with the Meritorious Service Award. Uh, this is in appreciation and gratitude for meritorious service in the interest of the Tiffin Fire Rescue Division, signed by the Mayor, City Administrator, and myself. Thank you for your Thank work. You Isaac's done a lot of work with us uh, with the uh, in conglomeration with the Tiffin Parks Department and uh, the, with launching our Youth Fire Academy. So he's uh, one of three of our members that worked with that and has done a fantastic job for us. He's joined off camera by his wife and new son tonight. So thank you all for being here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well done, sir. Next, I'd like to welcome in firefighter paramedic Keith Johnson. Uh, Keith and I have known each other for a few years now. We went through our uh, fire training together uh, just a couple of years ago, but it seems like they're getting more couple of years away. Um, this is actually the second time that Keith is being presented with this award. It's our uh, paramedic of the year, and it is in honor of your outstanding performance and dedication and characterizing the best attributes of being a paramedic. Uh, Keith has done an outstanding job uh, for our fire department, and as EMS is a very important component of what our service to this community is, uh, paramedic of the year is no small honor, and uh, so congratulations, Keith. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. And finally, I'd like to welcome in firefighter paramedic Scott Brooks. Hello. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew you would. <laughs> so uh, Scott also has been with our department for a good number of years now. Uh, he is very, very heavily involved in all the things that we do. He brings a lot of great energy uh, to his crew and to the department. Uh, like Isaac, he also is uh, one of our members that works with the uh, Tiffin Youth Fire Academy. Uh, so we really appreciate all of his work there. And so tonight I would like to uh, present Scott with the Firefighter of the Year Award. Um, this is in honor of your outstanding performance and dedication in characterizing all the best attributes of being a firefighter. So congratulations, Thank Scott. You. Thank you. He's joined tonight by his uh, wife, Olivia. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And their little girl. <laughs> Picture, she smiles. <laughs> <like 
So each one of these awards is special for, for me as the, the chief to get to present because the, these are not uh, picked by me. Uh, these are uh, these nominations are made by their peers and their officers. Uh, so I, I think it carries a little extra weight that way. Uh, so again, thank you all uh, for, for letting us do this presentation tonight, Mayor, for the proclamation. Much appreciated and uh, thank you all to the community. All right, uh, with that said, uh, next up this evening, we have Chief of Police David Pauley here this evening uh, as he runs out the door. Um, and he has a few awards to hand out for his department as well. So Chief, all right. it's all yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Mr. President, thank you. You can just come on in here. This is Officer Nowak, Justin Nowak, and Officer Marcus Summers here. And uh, I'm going to go off the camera so you can take a look at their pretty faces while I read something about them real quick here. On January 15th, 2022, officers of the Tiffin Police Department pursued a stolen vehicle that had an uninvolved person held captive in the back seat. The totality of the circumstances indicated the uninvolved person was a hostage held against his will. The driver refused to pull over and allow the uninvolved person to exit the vehicle and escape unharmed. Officer Marcus Summers and Officer Justin Nowak maintained the pursuit for the duration and used the appropriate amount of force to, to terminate the pursuit and arrest the subject. There's no doubt had force not been used in the termination of this pursuit, the subject would have continued to drive erratically, creating an even big, bigger risk to the public as well as to the uninvolved person held captive in the vehicle. By making the decision to stop the stolen vehicle and terminating the pursuit, you both saved the community from a reckless driver and perhaps saved the life of the hostage. This act is commendable and an example of community service at its best. For your exceptional work, you are both hereby awarded the Community Service and Lightning Bolt Award. The Community Service Award is presented to the recipient who goes above and beyond the call of duty performing an outstanding service to the community in one shining instance or in a continuing course of action over a longer period of time. The Lightning Bolt Award is presented to any officer for the apprehension of a perpetrator of a stolen vehicle. The Tiffin Police Department is proud to have officers of your caliber who go above and beyond the call of duty to serve the residents of this city. This is Officer Summers' first community service award and Officer Nowak's fourth. This is the first lightning bolt award for both officers. A special thanks also goes out to Officer Drew Westenbarger and Dispatcher Patty McIntyre, excuse me, for their assistance in bringing the matter to a safe conclusion. Congratulations, Officer Summers and Officer Nowak. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks. Not the same without all that clap. Congratulations, no. <laughs> guys. <laughs> have two more. I have just two more. All right. Yes, come on. All right, folks. Um, I'm proud to present uh, Sergeant uh, Scott McDowell and, and Sergeant Eric Aller. Uh, Officer Becca Tim was unable to make it today, so I will make sure that she does get her accommodation at another time. But I want you to take a look at these folks while I read something. On February 2nd, 2022, Sergeant Scott McDowell and Eric Aller, along with officers Michael Moore and Becca Tim, investigated an assault complaint on 2nd Avenue in the city of Tiffin. During that investigation, the identity was determined of the perpetrator involved in the assault. While searching the area, Sergeant McDowell observed the subject in a vehicle driving, <clears throat> and it was determined to be a stolen vehicle out of Sandusky County. Sergeant McDowell attempted to stop the vehicle, but the driver refused to comply with the traffic stop. Officers were led on a slow speed pursuit. If you remember, in February of 2022, um, there was a, a heavy, heavy snow day a, a couple of times, and this was one of those nights. So the officers pursued slowly. And they traveled into the area the days in on State Route 53. The suspect vehicle slid off the roadway and crashed. The driver exited the vehicle and fled on foot. Officers gave chase in the snow and across the frozen creek. Sergeant Aller, while giving chase, fell through the ice. The subject doubled back in an attempt to evade officers and hide inside the days in. Sergeant McDowell observed the subject inside the days in and apprehended him. 
As I mentioned previously, this award is presented to any officers for the apprehension of a perpetrator and a stolen vehicle. It must, the, this vehicle actually must be a stolen vehicle and not merely just returned or an unauthorized use of a vehicle. Through your actions, you have brought great credit upon the city of Tiffin, the Tiffin Police Department and yourselves. Your hard work, dedication, investigative skills are to be commended and you are hereby awarded the Departmental Lightning Bolt Award. This is Sergeant McDowell and Sergeant Aller's first Lightning Bolt Award and Officer Becca Tim's second Lightning Bolt Award. A special thanks goes to dispatcher uh, Cunningham, Candy Cunningham, who did a great job orchestrating communications during the incident, and Officer Michael Moore, who was involved in the case, but not in the recovery of the stolen vehicle and the subject. Job well done by all. Congratulations to all the officers this evening, the Tiffin Police Department, this community are very proud of you and grateful for the excellent public service you provide to the residents of Tiffin. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you folks for allowing me to do that tonight. It's, uh, it's always an honor to be able to, uh, to commend our officers and to, to kind of put them on a pedestal. These folks never want to be on a pedestal. And so I asked their chief, it's, uh, it gives me a, a, a little bit of pride and joy to, to kind of pump them up a little bit and put them on that pedestal. So thank you very much for that. Okay. I uh, appreciate everyone. Uh, this is obviously not the most ideal way to do these sorts of things. Uh, we certainly wish that we are in person, but uh, we're still able to uh, present our officers with an award uh, for, for doing all of the great things, whether it's in our fire rescue division or in the police department. So thank you to all of them. Um, just a couple of other things yet this evening, um, if you'd bear with me. Uh, next up, Kevin Hughes uh, from the Water Pollution Control Center is here. Uh, Kevin is the superintendent out at the wastewater treatment plant, and he will be uh, providing us with his annual report uh, to all of you this evening. So uh, Kevin is this evening. Uh, we have two more to go through the year. We'll have Dave Pauley providing the, the police annual report at the next meeting on the 16th of May. And the final report will be Chief Chapel on the 6th of June, and that will conclude our annual report. So uh, Kevin has joined us. Welcome, Kevin, and uh, the show is yours. Do you, I'm not sure, do you have a slideshow and need to share your screen or are you just doing it from there? Yes, I do have a slideshow. Okay. You should be able to, if you can't let me know and I'll recheck the permissions. Okay, all right, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, City Administrator, and thanks City Council for allowing me to come and do my annual presentation for 2021 for the wastewater plant. I do have a short slideshow. Um, but it shouldn't take too long. Um, okay, so can everyone see it okay? I hope. Looks good. Okay. All right, so because last year uh, wrapped up the largest upgrade here at the plant um, that we've ever had, I wanted to just briefly go back through the history of the wastewater plant. Um, just along the lines of when it was first built and then um, some of the upgrades that took place along the way. So the plant was built in um, 1955, which it only consisted of primary treatment. So the water came in, it was screened and went through two settling tanks and then out to the river. Before that, there obviously the flow, the wastewater went directly into the river. Um, in 1968 was the first upgrade and that's where secondary treatment was added. So there were three secondary settling tanks, uh, aeration tanks, digesters for the solids that came off the bottom of the primary clarifiers. And they also started using chlorine for disinfection before the water went to the river. And then sodium thiosulfate was added to that to take the chlorine out. Um, 1988 was the next um, significant upgrade. Uh, a third digester was added for a longer detention time for the biosolids, uh, a chlorine building to house all the, chlor the chlorine stuff. And then there was also a 
primary bypass tank that was added, which allowed, so when the plant added secondary treatment, they were only able to treat 4 million gallons through the whole plant, which was still the case after 1988, but they could take between four and 16 million through the primary bypass. So that water only had primary treatment and then the 4 million gallons that the whole plant could take would get full treatment and then discharge to the river. Um, then 2015 was kind of the start of a three phase project. Um, 2015 was the first one. And then the one we just completed was phase two. Um, phase three would be the addition of an EQ basin, which won't be like till 2024. But part of the 2015 upgrade, um, we're replacing our bar screens. And the pictures on the left show the old ones and the bottom left shows the bar screens had three quarter inch gaps. So it allowed quite a bit of solids to pass through where the ones put in in 2015, the bottom right picture, there are only quarter inch gap between each bar screen, which allows for a lot more of the solids to be screened out, which protects the downstream equipment quite a bit. Uh, also, in the 2015 upgrade, um, we replaced our aerators in the aeration tanks. Um, the top left picture shows the old coarse bubble diffusers in the bottoms of the tank. And then the bottom left picture shows the top of the aeration tank with those diffusers on. You can see how turbulent the water is. And then the, on the right side, the top is the new diffusers that were put in in 15. They're fine bubble diffusers. And the bottom right picture shows the top of the water with, with them on. The, the smaller bubbles allows for better oxygen transfer, which allows you to, allows for more efficiency. Um, a lot less energy is used um, when you're trying to maintain a certain dissolved oxygen level in your aeration tanks. And I'll kind of touch on that later too. Um, so the 2020-21 upgrade, the main goal of, of that was to increase the capacity of the plant from 4 million gallons a day to 13 million gallons a day. And the biggest way that was achieved was by adding a fourth secondary tank, um, 80 foot diameter tank that can hold the same amount that the three previously existing primary or secondary settling tanks could hold. Also, we updated a lot of the electrical components and redid a lot of the wiring, um, got rid of all the overhead wiring, everything now is underground. Also replaced all four raw pumps and our return sludge pumps and eliminated the use of chlorine and switched to ultraviolet disinfection. Um, so my next few slides are just kind of some pictures of when the project started and just some of the progress along the way. The one on the left is from April 20th. Um, Peterson Construction, they had been here for about a month and a half at that point, um, but they, they moved fairly quickly and um, did a great job. So you can see kind of the progress, uh, it, they move really fast. The back half of the plant was put on, put into uh, treatment in uh, the end of December, beginning of January, 2021. And here in this picture, you can see where the new um, larger secondary settling tank to the left of the screen that is filled at this point, And they are still doing the work on our three previously existing secondary settling tanks. And they're still doing work on some of the primary tanks at this point. And this is when the project was complete um, before grass really started to grow, but you could see the whole plants online, um, all of the driveways were repaved and everything's pretty much as it is today. This, this is actually the last aerial photo that we had from the summer of last year, where we actually had some grass growing at this point. And I have a few pictures of some of the different areas of the plant. These are our four new raw pumps. Um, so it takes three of them to achieve the 13 million gallons a day that we need. And then we have a fourth for redundancy in case one of the pumps goes down 
um, we can put that online and still achieve the 13 million gallons. And this is a picture of on the left is our primary splitter box where the water is pumped to after the raw pumps. And then on the right is our primary, one of our two primary clarifiers. And you can see in the, on the primary clarifier, the old concrete level, that was the height of the primary tanks previously. And the primary splitter box was about a little, just a little bit higher than that old concrete that shows on the primary clarifiers. But the reason for incre increasing the height so much is, um, so the raw pumps pump the water up to that splitter box. And by increasing the height here, it allowed for gravity flow through the rest of the plant, which allowed us to eliminate four secondary settling pumps. So that was, that was a really nice improvement for us because we normally had quite a few issues with our secondary pumps. That was one of AECOM's ideas. That was like midway through design. So that was nice. And here's a picture of our anaerobic tank, which is right after the primary clarifiers. This was a part of the project also. So the, the purpose of the anaerobic tank is, so our biological side of the plant, which we just kind of refer to as our bugs, they, they're returned from the secondary clarifiers back into this anaerobic tank which the purpose of it is, is you starve those bugs of oxygen, which allows for denitrification, which promotes um, phosphorus and ammonia removal without use of chemicals. Because the only way we were able to reduce our phosphorus levels before was the use of ferrous chloride, which we still use ferrous, but not quite as much anymore. And 2015 project, that blower on the left was added. And then in 21, we added a second airs and blower. It's a little bit smaller. The one in 2015 we found was a little bit oversized for what we need on a regular basis, but in higher flows, um, we do need the, the larger blower. And this is our return activated sludge building and ferrous storage tanks. So half that building is taken up by two, two large um, tanks that hold our ferrous, ferrous chloride. And then the picture on the right just shows the return activated sludge pumps. They are the pumps that pump off of the bottom of the secondary settling tanks back to that anaerobic tank. And this is just a picture of our, the new 80 foot diameter secondary clarifier. And this is a picture of our UV the picture on the left is before we actually even put it in um, to use. We were still getting training here, I believe. And then the picture on the right was just last week. So we're only uh, required to disinfect the water in between May 1st and October 31st. So we just put it back online and this will be our second year of using it. And so far, so good. Um, we've had really good results with our E. coli's. With, the, with this and like I said, that allowed us to eliminate chlorine and sodium thiosulfate. So after the water passes through the UV, um, the picture on the left is the post air tank. It's just to the right of the UV building. It allows us to, it has some of the same um, air diffusers at the bottom. That's why you can kind of see the, the bubbling a little bit, but that allows us to add air if we need to before the water enters the river, um, we have a minimum dissolved oxygen content that we have to have, which is monitored continuously. Um, so we can add air to that if, if necessary. And then the picture on the right is just the new outfall where the water enters the Sandusky River. And then the picture on the left is just a few of the new areas where there's new electrical components. Um, there's a couple of new small buildings where where the electrical stuff is housed, um, keeping it separate from a lot of the actual water areas allows us to not have to upgrade to explosion proof equipment, which saves a lot of money. It's a lot cheaper to build a small enclosure than it is to upgrade to explosion proof. In the picture on the right is our new plant generator. Um, so our old generator only allowed us to operate half of the plant at a time. 
and it was a manual transfer, which meant if we did have a power outage, we would, you know, I would get an alarm call and then I would have to get a hold of somebody else. And there'd be two of us that would come out to the plant and manually transfer power to half of the plant on the generator and then either stay here, stay at the plant until power came back on to switch back over or, you know, come back in and do that. Where this new generator, it's automatic transfer within 15 seconds of a power outage, it will transfer to generator power and it'll automatically transfer back to um, regular power once it senses stable power feed for more than 30 minutes. And it allows us to run the entire plant off of it. And a few of the post upgrade benefits. So before the 2015 project, the monthly electric bills averaged about 16,000 a month. And then after the 2015 project with the install of the, the new high efficiency blower and the fine bubble diffusers in the aeration tank, our electric bill average dropped to 10,000 a month. And then after the this last project, so for this last summer, our or this last year in 21, our electric bills averaged 7,500 per month, which is a total annual savings of over $100,000 a year. Um, also switching from chlorine to UV, we didn't see any kind of real increase in our electric bills, obviously. So you can, um, we were spending about $20,000 annually on chlorine and sodium thiosulfate, and now we, we don't need either one of those. And maintenance on the UV hasn't been very significant at all. So it's pretty much all savings there. And then adding the anaerobic tank, which allows for the biological nutrient removal, we've used about 30% less ferrous chloride in this past year, which was a savings of about $6,000. And we're hoping, you know, the longer we run this plant, the more efficient we can get it and the more um, biological nutrient removal we can achieve without chemicals. So we're hoping to even save more on ferrous chloride in the years following. And this chart just kind of shows um, some of the, the average flows in 20 and 21. Um, you, there's really not a big difference in, in the average flow. But then if you look at the last two columns, you can see the peak flows in 20 and 21. You can see where we were able to take quite a bit more um, through the plant at one given time. It really didn't equate to a lot more total flow for the whole year. But I think that just kind of points out that it's really not that often that we're at these really high flows. Um, most of the time, you know, we if we get a peak flow of like in June, we had 7 million gallons was a peak flow. We didn't maintain that for a very long time or, or any of the other peak flows, you know, it's usually for short periods of time. And we are one of the few plants around that still um, land applies our biosolids. Um, this is just a few pictures from when we've done in the past. Um, we have EPA approved fields that are close to the plant and our guys will, um, the bottom left picture kind of shows us one of our guys on one of our semis and we have two tanker trucks and then we'll haul it out to the field and um, field inject it with our egg chem, which you can barely see in the picture on the right, it's pretty blurry. And as everybody knows, uh, the brush pile and uh, our leaf composting pile, we took in over 300,000 cubic yards in brush last year, which we ground down and kept 20% to give to, to residents as mulch and had the other 80% hauled off. And we took in about 310 cubic yards of leaves last year, composted them down and gave out about 100, 100 cubic yards of compost in the fall. Oh, also towards the end of last year, we hosted uh, Northwest Ohio Water Environmental Association meeting here at the plant. Um, there were about 60 people who attended, um, EPA people and you know operators and other wastewater workers in the area. Um, as a result of that, Ohio Water Environmental Association puts out a magazine each month with the Buckeye Bulletin, as you can see, and Tiffin's wastewater plant was featured in that magazine in January of this year. Um, some additional accomplishments 
um, in 21. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but uh, just to point out a few, um, our lab ran over 7,500 tests in-house on plant and industrial samples. And if you, if you included like the tests that we, samples and tests that we run just for in-house purposes for plant control, I'm sure that would be over 10,000 easily. Um, our maintenance guys here at the plant, they continue to maintain the city's 18 lift stations and they, did, they, they check those twice a week and per, you know provide any maintenance needed, pull the pumps when needed, um, cleaning them or rebuilding if necessary. Um, we, had, we did replace the roof on our blower building this past year. And um, another significant project we had was one of our heat exchangers we had completely rebuilt. And we have the other one scheduled to be rebuilt this year um, by Walter Brothers in Fremont. Um, that's pretty much it for the plant. Um, but I did wanna mention the downspout removal grant program that the city is offering right now. Um, if anyone has downspouts connected to the sanitary sewer or knows of anyone that does, um, please feel free to give me a call. There's a grant that will reimburse up to $1,000 for disconnecting your downspouts from the sanitary. Um, a good way to tell is if your downspouts go into the ground, there's a good chance that they're connected to the sanitary unless you know where they come out otherwise. I don't know if the, anyone has any questions or... I did have one last slide just to... Thank you, and uh, wanted to throw a golf cart in there just to say if city council wanted to look at golf carts again to allow them on the street, now would be a great time with gas prices so high. <laughs> Appreciate the annual report, uh, Kevin. Council members, uh, do any of you have any questions or comments uh, for, for Kevin? Council member Jones. Thank you, Council President Gillig. A uh, couple minor ones, but I'll skip over those. <clears throat> Director Hughes, whatever your title is, you said the UV is only ran six months a year. Why not 12 months a year? Uh, the EPA, as of now, only requires certain states to disinfect their wastewater um, six months of the year. Um, so we have our MPDS permit, and that's, that's what it requires us to do. Um, basically, the northern states, most of them just disinfect May through October. Okay. And then if I wanted to look at a copy of the January Buckeye Bulletin, you have it at your location, I'm sure. Yeah, I could send you the link if you'd like to a okay. digital copy. That'd be fine. I'd like to see it. Okay. Any other I'd questions? Also add, uh, I'd also add that... Uh, number of council members had an opportunity to tour the wastewater treatment center this summer and it is just a amazing operation and with this being our 200th birthday here in the city uh, kevin it's got me thinking um you know how envious our ancestors would be that that this type of technology and and this knowledge is available because may i ask uh, what would the health risks have been, uh, you know, in the days where, where wastewater was released directly into the river? Oh, geez. a lot. Um, if you came in contact with that, you know, the fecal matter, you know, dysentery, um, any kind of E. coli infection. Um, and I'm sure back then nothing like that was really treated or um, hepatitis is also another one that you'd be susceptible to. So essentially this is the greatest value in the history of civilization is what you're, <laughs> what you're For telling sure. us. For sure. More or less. <laughs> Outstanding. Council member Perry, I believe I saw your hand. Yeah. I just want to tell him um, good job of the presentation. Um, it's cool to see uh, how far we've come, you know, out there. And, um, and also just kudos on that last slide. Great. <laughs> slide that in. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Kevin. I think I'm outnumbered now, so yeah. Yeah, just, I hope so. Just <laughs> FYI, if, if anyone, good. if anyone that wasn't able to make that tour ever wants to take a tour of the plant, they're always welcome. Just give me a call. 
Um, we don't really need a group. It can be one person or, or whatever, anything. And certainly it'd be a wonderful opportunity for our, uh, for our science and, and STEM teachers as well, just the amount of teaching opportunities out there. Uh, Council Member Jones. Yes, uh, Kevin, I might take you up on that one-on-one -on -one tour because you said smaller bubbles produce more oxygen than larger bubbles on that one slide. And I'd like to learn more about that. That doesn't make sense to me, but we can do that later. Well, the oxygen transfer is just, is better. So it allows you to use less air to maintain the same dissolved oxygen content as, as larger bubbles. But yeah, you're welcome anytime you'd like. <laughs> Head still spinning, but okay. <laughs> Well, Kevin, thank you very much for your presentation. You know, I know some of us who took the tour, it was a lot of information that we already knew, but there were many council members who were not able to make it to the general public. That's a lot of important information. Uh, that upgrade at the facility uh, was probably the single largest expense that we've ever had in the city's history out there with uh, as far as the, the dollars being spent uh, to upgrade your facility and also finding, you know, the money that you're saving now annually on your electric bill and other things. It's just you run a very good plant out there and we're very appreciative of you and your staff that make everything run because most of us don't give any attention at all to the sewer system uh, in Tiffin and underground until it causes a problem. And then when there is no, when your sewer is not working, it is your biggest problem uh, that you can have. So we're very appreciative for, for you all kind of flying under the radar and, and keeping everything's flowing, uh, pun intended, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, we, we have a great staff out here. A lot of guys have been here for a long time and um, I'm very, we're all very appreciative of the city's willingness to spend money out here. Um, I've been here 18 years now and the plant now compared to when I started is just nine day different. And I could go on and on about all the new changes. And I mean, I can, I can sit at home and log on to this um, plant's site and log on to our SCADA system and turn on and off pumps and acknowledge alarms. It's just, it's so different from what it was. It's, it's, it's great, really. Yeah, well, a lot of this has been done under your leadership out there at the Water Pollution Control Center. So you've got a heck of a good team working with you and for you out there. So we're appreciative. And if this community is going to continue to grow, the added capacity will only help us as well, but um, continue to, to have that machine uh, function like a well-oiled machine out there. And uh, it sounds like you're gonna be taking Ken Jones on a personal tour. So you should have saved the, the uh, tank cleaning and Ken could have helped you with all yeah. that, that you just completed. Well, there's always something to clean. I know, I, I could have seen, we could have sent Ken in with a little scuba outfit and he could have looked at all those bubbles and reported the bubble size to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank, thank you. you, Kevin, we appreciate it. Um, thank you very much this evening. Thank you guys, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. President, we have one last uh, presentation this evening. Again, I apologize uh, um, for the length of everything. Uh, we have Dave Olds uh, with us tonight. Um, and I believe he may be joined by, by Mir Chahandru. Um, they're going to discuss the mental health response team that's being created uh, to assist law enforcement in the community um, with those in a mental health crisis. So I'm going to bring them in. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dave and Mircha and, and anyone who's, I'm not even sure who's all in the room with them, but I want to thank them for being so patient this evening. Um, and I want to thank all of you for it. I know it's a lot uh, that we've covered tonight. That's why I've tried to keep my report uh, as short as possible. So uh, Dave, if you can hear us, you'll just have to unmute yourself. It's entirely up to you if you're turning the screen on up. Oh, there we go. Um, good evening. Good evening. How are you? We're doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Appreciate everyone having me here. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Dave for inviting me as well. Uh, I don't think Merch is gonna be here tonight. I'm not sure, did he show up at all today? In the- uh... I did not see him in the room, in the attending okay. room, so maybe not. Probably just me then. Okay, um, well, that's so fine. <laughs> I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes and basically what I wanted to do was explain a new uh, program that is coming to Seneca County and Tiffin as a whole. Um, so my name is Dave Olds and I work for NAMI Northwest, which is in Fremont. 
and I run a mobile crisis response team. Back in August of 2020, Merchant Andrew approached me and asked me if I would design a new team um, to basically help assist law enforcement and EMS in handling of mental health calls. Uh, I agreed and said that I didn't want to run the team, but you see where that got me. So here I am. Um, but, you know, it's been a good ride so far. Um, so we started this team back in August of 2021 uh, as a pilot project in Sandusky County only. Since we started that program, um, we, as of today, have seen over 312 people in the Sandusky County and in some other areas. Uh, we've also been into five different counties to assist law enforcement who are having a tough time handling these types of calls. And um, it's been a, a real privilege to actually be able to do some of those things and to be able to help people do that, um, the law enforcement officers and EMS especially. We've had a lot of really good success. Um, but basically, when we started this program, I had to research and find out what was available to us as a model. And we found out that there really wasn't anything for our rural areas. There were a lot of urban area uh, models, but nothing really for the rural. So we had to basically design this from the ground up. And uh, we are very, very fortunate to have something like this in our area. Um, I have already presented this at uh, CIT Ohio, which is Crisis Intervention Teams Ohio in Columbus a few weeks back. I presented for the Ohio Association of Chiefs of Police and also the Buckeye State Sheriff's, Sheriff's Association. And one of the first questions I ask is how many of you have a mobile crisis response team to assist you in handling these calls? And in the OACP meeting, I had none. In the uh, CIT Ohio, I had a few. And in the BSSA, they had one or two and they were around the Cincinnati Dayton areas. Uh, Columbus also has one. So we're very, very fortunate in our counties to have something like this. And um, around Christmas time, Mercha, apparently I did a good job at building this team because around Christmas time, Mercha came to me and he says, I want you to expand it into the four county region now, which is what the Mental Health Recovery Services Board covers. So we're gonna be expanding July 1st to cover um, Seneca, Ottawa, Sandusky and Wyandotte counties. We are actually in the hiring phase right now to hire on the new staff members that we need. Um, we held interviews today and we have them for the rest of this week actually. We have interviews or interviewing people. And what we're looking to do is to um, grow the team by two more full-time teams. And we're gonna have a, a total of three teams to cover four counties. Uh, we typically work Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. And so our dispatch centers and um, our law enforcement officers and all of our EMS crews have uh, the ability to contact us and say, can you come help us? Um, so we respond to all the 911 calls or regular telephone calls for, for any kind of mental health or overdose or addiction related calls. And we go into the, the calls with them. And what's really kind of important here is that we have the ability to actually thank the officers or EMS for being there. And if they're not needed anymore, put them straight back to patrol or put the EMS straight back into service. Um, we have the ability, thanks to Mercha, he uh, has a, a found ways for us to be able to take people directly to psychiatric wards or to inpatient counseling or therapy um, so that we can actually do the transport. We can take care of everyone and we don't have to rely on law enforcement to do that. Um, if you talk to law enforcement right now, anywhere in those four county region, and you ask them if they pick up somebody for a mental health issue and they take them to a local hospital, how long are they going to typically sit there? And the answer is anywhere from three to 12 hours. So we're able to cut down on a lot of the time that they're going to spend on those calls. And also one of the things that we're doing is cutting down on recidivism. Uh, when I first started this team, Dean Bliss, who was the Fremont police chief at that time, uh, came to me and he said, hey, Dave, I need some help. We handled 75 mental health calls in the last month and a half. And the sheriff's office had just about as many. And I asked him how many of those were the same people over and over. And he said about 10 people total accounted for about 90 percent of the calls. So instead of just having a team that would go out and handle crisis after crisis after crisis, what we designed was a team that actually handled the crisis, but then took them and handed them off to someone else who would work with them long term. And that person in our office is called a navigator. The two people in the field are a crisis, inter or crisis intervention specialist and a crisis case manager. And those are the people who are actually responsible for de-escalating situations and finding proper placement or doing safety plans or whatever is needed in the community to basically um, connect people with services at that time. And then the navigator works long-term to connect uh, basically anything from basic needs all the way up to mental health and or drug and alcohol addiction. So we're, we're doing a lot of really good things. We've got a lot of really good success stories thus far. Um, 
just to, as an example of cutting down on recidivism, when I first started this program, I went to Fremont Police Department on a midnight shift to explain it to their officers. And one of the officers came in about 20 minutes late and he says, hey, Dave, uh, you know, I'm sorry I was late, but I had just took the same person to the hospital for the third time today, which gave me a little cause for concern. But, I, you know, I let it go. And, and then fast forward to the first day we started this team. And that was one of our very first referrals was that same exact person. Um, we went out to her house about 20 different times. She just wouldn't engage with us at all, either locked the door, slammed the door, turned up music, did whatever, just wouldn't even talk to us. About the 21st time, she finally took our information, but wouldn't talk to us. And about two weeks later, she called us and said, I'm in trouble. I need help. Can you help me? And we said, yes, absolutely. So we engaged with her about the end of August of 2021. And at that time, Fremont PD would get anywhere from one to five calls, either about her or from her a day, because she was very psychotic and delusional and believed someone had was constantly breaking into her house and that she was in danger all the time. So she would be out front of her house yelling and screaming in the street. So Fremont PD would go over there and search the home and do whatever they could to kind of tuck her in for the night and make her feel better. Um, since that time that we've engaged with her, she has not been rearrested, rehospitalized, and she stopped calling Fremont PD. I think they've had two calls on her in nine months and that's uh, one of them was me. <laughs> so um, it's really cut down on that individual. Doesn't work for everyone that well, but luckily for us on this one, we just actually heard from her a couple of days ago and she just called to say, I'm doing great. I appreciate what you guys did for me. So it does help. It works a lot, uh, very well in a lot of these cases. So we're very um, enthused about the results that we're getting. We have been to Seneca County and especially to Tiffin a number of times already and worked with a number of people in your community. Uh, one of them is our, an actual success, success story for us. Um, another very psychotic, very delusional person, but the person was um, an immigrant that did not speak English at all. And one of our team members is fluent in um, English, Spanish, and Italian, and was able to actually go there and interact with her, get her talked into services. And um, we got her now where she's actually doing really well, very stable, uh, doing a lot better than what she was. We've got her connected with therapists and medication and whatever she needs at this point. So another very good success story, and it comes out of Tiffin. So um, we respond to pretty much any legitimate mental health calls. But like I said, we have three teams to cover four counties. So we have to uh, establish prioritizing for all of our calls. And we do a lot of other things that are aimed at the recidivism rates and that kind of stuff as well. Um, we do welfare checks now. So typically when a mental health provider hasn't heard from a client or is fearful that that client may be in a crisis situation, who do they call to go check on them? They call law enforcement. Well, now Monday through Friday, 10 to 6, they actually call us and ask us to do it. And so we'll go out and do it. So it's just another way that we're cutting down on that, that case log or that backlog for law enforcement EMS um, to not have to go out on every single mental health related call. And we're also going out in the community with the mental health clinicians to either help them administer or provide medications to people. Um, as you can imagine, one of the barriers to treatment and one of the barriers to stability is that they don't have transportation. So we will actually go out with the nurse from Firelands or with the caseworkers who had their mental their um, med sets for the week or the month or whatever it might be, and we'll we'll take them to the people so that they they actually have them. And then we'll go back and check on them, make sure that they continue to uh, take them in the appropriate ways. Um, so we're just still doing a lot of really good work. Um, law enforcement, and us and EMS are kind of approaching this as a uh, partnership. And we're all working together on this. And so I just wanted to make you all aware of what is coming. Like I said, it will be July 1st when we actually have a team that will be assigned in Seneca County. Um, Sheriff Stevens is actually giving us an office there at the Sheriff's Department. Um, so you'll see a vehicle with a mobile crisis response team logo on it, tooling around Tiffin quite a bit, I'm sure. Um, and so we look forward to working with all of you. And I just wanted to thank you all for letting me be here to explain what the team looks like and kind of what we're gonna do. And if any of you have any questions in, in the future, you can get in touch with me, uh, Dave Pauly, everybody at Tiffin PD has my phone number. So um, just give me a call or let me know if you have anything or any needs or concerns. Dave, I just want to thank you because I know uh, Chief Paul has explained the program to me and I also sat through this when you presented at the commissioner's meeting. So it's the second right. time we've been able to hear this now, but just talk about a tremendous program. You know, you, you, you look at how busy our police officers are already and EMS folks are, you know, we're, we're the paramedics running the squad. 
and and the the help that you're going to be able to you and your team are going to be able to provide these individuals who are in distress and in many cases uh, not every time but many cases do not need the police there they do not need the paramedics there they need someone who is who's a qualified mental health health professional um, it's going to not only free up the time of our police officers our our fire and ems but also potentially get people the right help that they need versus at times when they're having some sort of mental distress or, or, or a potential mental breakdown or issue, the cops show up, doesn't always send someone the right, the right trigger. You know, that, that may create a much worse situation with the police showing up. So I think this, this, just, this program is tremendous and I can't thank you and Mircha and the, the chiefs and everyone who has, has been a part of this at kind of spearheading things because this has been needed for a long time. So thank you for, for helping us address this issue uh, with, with our folks here in Tiffin and Seneca County. Very happy to, happy to help, Mayor. Thank you very much. Yes. Are there any questions or comments for, uh, for Dave Olds this evening? Dave, I feel like this, is, this has got to be almost cutting edge, especially for a rural area such as Tiffin and Seneca County. And, you know, just wanted to to, to thank you for uh, providing the service, just as Mayor Mons alluded to. If you think about the trauma a number of these individuals have experienced and that's been shared with our police and EMS and, and fire, seeing those individuals as the mayor alluded to would certainly make things uh, very difficult. So I'm just very grateful this, this team is in place. Thank you, I appreciate it, yes. We'll do our best. Anyone else questions or comments? Okay, well, Dave, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank you for, for your patience this evening as well. And I will uh, take you on out of here so you don't have to worry about. All right, looks like you've got that. Okay, um, the only other thing that I just want to, uh, to say, two things quickly. One, tomorrow is election day. If you have not voted, please do so tomorrow. The polls are open until 7.30. Uh, it's your, your civic duty, your right. So many folks fought for that right and died, have been imprisoned and had their lives changed forever. So please do your civic duty and vote tomorrow if you have not. Uh, and then also I would like to invite all of you as well as the public uh, to an event next Wednesday. So not this coming Wednesday, but Wednesday the 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, in the Tiffin Middle School Cafetorium. Uh, and it is an event for the uh, um, search for the new superintendent of the Tiffin City Schools. Uh, it is open to the public. It will be a meet and greet with the top two to three candidates that evening, uh, open to all the public council members, et cetera. There will be a question and answer session. So if you're available and you're interested in coming to find out more information about the, the future leader of the Tiffin City Schools, please attend that event and give feedback. Um, uh, the school board would like to hear it. Uh, they'll be the ones making the hire. Um, I'm going to help moderate a question and answer session that evening uh, of the candidates for uh, superintendent. So please show up. Um, this is a great opportunity for not only the public, but city council and others in leadership uh, to impact and help the school system uh, in their time that they need our help right now uh, to get some things straightened out with the, the future superintendent and the leadership of the schools. So uh, without that, I apologize for the length, tons of good information tonight, uh, but I will wrap things up now, Mr. President, and turn things back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I certainly don't think any apology is needed with the wonderful proclamations uh, that you issued this evening. Was the first one, was that inspired by Mr. Kirian uh, calling in last at the last meeting? So, yes, so Mr. Kirian, uh, we, had, we had worked with him uh, previous to him talking to us at the last meeting, but we made sure we incorporated the DIPG Awareness Day as well with his suggestion uh, for this proclamation. So um, we've been working on it for a while with uh, Mr. Kirian and, and we were happy to go ahead and issue that and, and get, uh, uh, the May declared as Brain Tumor Awareness Month and then DIPG Day for May 17th. And then, you know, with, with the firefighters and, you know, I don't want to take up too much time, but just the amount of decisions and problem solving skills they have to make for split seconds are, are amazing. You know, 
my last trip, I was, I was sidelined by the stomach bug that seemingly swept through the city. And, you know, the, the gentleman that came up the stairs had to figure out, you know, how, how are we going to get this 380 pound man down three flights of stairs? And it's really remarkable that they, you know, put those types of problem solving skills to use in such a, such a noble profession. And uh, the, the other final comment uh, I have, uh, the, uh, the case of baby fever that may sweep through the city of Tiffin can be blamed on the uh, children of uh, Mr. Heiser and Mr. Brooks when they showed up on the screen. My goodness, that was borderline ridiculous. And uh, if anybody heard the mayor and Chief Pauly laughing, it's because I happened to have a bag of snacks and was able to throw that to calm a uh, upset child. Um, so... He did. Oh, I, 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 I would. He he didn't throw the snacks at the child. <laughs> I rolled them. He rolled them very nicely. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank um, you, Mr. President. We'll move on to uh, Clerk of Council and Forest. No report, Mr. President. Thank you, Director of Finance Kathy Kaufman. No report, Mr. President. Thank you, Director of Law Brent T. Howard. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Just a, a few items. Um, first, um, you, uh, Council, approved Ordinance 22-23, which um, authorized the uh, encroachment easement uh, granted to um, Old Trinity Episcopal Church for the Community Kitchen Project. Uh, let you know that the easement uh, was prepared, signed by the mayor, and recorded, so that will allow that encroachment of the footers in on Jefferson Street. Uh, the next item, um, I wanna remind you about uh, ordinance 22-3, which is on the table. Um, that was, uh, as you recall, that's the ordinance that uh, continues the road and bridge levy for five years. That was submitted to the voters and as the mayor mentioned, uh, I think tomorrow is election day and in particular, the road and bridge levy is on the ballot. Uh, the city will need, a council will need to wait until the city receives a certification of the election results before they, um, before you take that ordinance off the table and then vote on it based on um, the, the vote, uh, the voters uh, wishes uh, at tomorrow's election. And that will probably won't be at the next elect, uh, next uh, meeting. It probably will take um, uh, more than two weeks uh, before the Board of Elections certifies the results to the city. So I would think that the first meeting in June, you'll have the certified results and then you can act on uh, the Ordinance 22-3. And I would hope that uh, the voters uh, uh, approve the continuation of the road and bridge levy. So I wanted to remind you about the procedure for that, that particular ordinance. Finally, um, I believe uh, when you uh, opened the meeting, um, Mr. President, you uh, said there were five uh, members of council. I wanna remind you that there are six, including yourself, and you retain the right to vote on legislation this evening. So there are six voting members. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director of Law Howard. That's uh, why I'm a history teacher and not mathematics. Very good. Do we have any written communications, Council Clerk? Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, we do. We have request for legislation um, from the Director of Finance, number F22-15 to amend the 2022 budget ordinance 21-105 to appropriate funds into the city hall budget. And okay. Finance director's request for legislation F22-15 will be held on file in the council clerk's office as ordinance 22-38 has been prepared for this evening's meeting. And that concludes the written communications. Thank you. At this time, we are now under oral communications. Anyone wishing to address council may utilize the raise hand feature available through the Zoom app 
and direct their questions to council president. Okay, uh, we only have one attendee in the room. So uh, uh, it's Adam Gilmore. I don't know, if, Adam, if you wanna speak, raise your hand. If not, uh, we're gonna continue. Adam, I'd be delighted to know what you did your independent study on at the College of Worcester, but that can wait for another time. <laughs> His hand is not up, Mr. President, so it appears uh, we're good. Very good. We will move on to motions at this time. Um, I'll defer to the law director. Would this be an appropriate time to make a motion to decide on if we will be virtual or in person for our next regularly scheduled council meeting? Sure, it'd be an appropriate uh, time to, to entertain that uh, issue. Is there anyone that would like to make a motion in one way or the other. Councilman Leopard. Trying to get the unmute button in. Uh, yes, I would, uh, I would open it up for discussion, but uh, uh, I think it's uh, time we, we uh, get back to meeting in person if, uh, if our council members are Healthy enough to do that. Council Member Tuno. Second the motion to meet in person. We have a motion and a second to meet in person at our next regularly scheduled city council meeting. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Perry. Just, uh, I guess a question. If we were gonna meet in person, would we need to make a motion since that's kind of what we're supposed to do anyways or like at next meeting we want to have to do the same motion would we that's an excellent question i'll defer to uh law director howard yeah no i, I appreciate that question i thought about that um i think given your um your recent practice of meetings by zoom via the internet that i think it makes sense to have this initial motion to kind of move back for your next meeting just make sure everybody knows and there's consensus to do that but then i would agree that um, by your um, existing ordinance that you would just continue to meet um, in person uh, unless uh, there would be some reason that you would um, uh, decide otherwise It seems very fair to me. Council Member Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my family situation has uh, improved and I'm back in Tiffin and I was planning on being at the meeting on the 16th, so I concur. And I, I fortunately appear to be uh, on the upswing. Um, just got to get the blood pressure under control. That seems to be the last holdout, but I, I certainly uh, appreciate council being willing to meet virtually for the last few meetings while I've battled some of my health problems. Any further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm very, very supportive of you all going back in person. Um, I certainly would like to see that as well. Uh, and just know that at your next meeting, uh, early on in the evening, we'll probably have an executive session at that point. So plan for a little extra time at the next meeting. And I do feel like we have the best of both worlds with being able to stream on Facebook Live uh, for the for the participation for the folks that aren't able to, to physically make it. Any further discussion? If not, I'll ask the council clerk to call a vote on the motion to resume meeting in person for city council. Okay. Council member Yanatuno. Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Perry? Yes. And, okay. And Mr. Uh, Councilman Gillig, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. The motion uh, passes by a vote of six to zero. We are now under resolutions. Oh, excuse me, Council Member Leopard. Uh, can we continue with motions? Yes, absolutely. I thought of that immediately. Mm -hmm. um, we will revert to uh, to motions. Councilmember Leopard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would uh, seek to have resolution number 22-16 be read in its entirety. We have a motion to read resolution 22-16 in its entirety. Do we have a second? Councilmember Perry. 
Yeah, I'll second this, President. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to read resolution 22-16 in its entirety. Um, Law Director Howard, would this be okay for a voice vote or should we take a roll call? Uh, you can uh, do a voice vote if there seems to be any uh, question about the outcome. You can call for a, a roll call vote. Very good. I'm going to call for a voice vote. All those in favor of reading resolution 22-16 in its entirety, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Any further motions? Very good, we'll move on to resolutions. Resolution number 22-13 introduced by Steve Leppard. Resolution accepting the recommendation of the Tax Incentive Review Council to continue certain tax incentive agreements with local businesses and property owners and declaring an emergency. That is the third reading of resolution 22-13. Council member Leopard. I'm sorry, Mr. President. I would ask for passage of resolution number 22-13. We have motion for passage of resolution 22-13. Do we have a second? Council member Yana Tuno. Second, Mr. President. We have a motion and a second for passage of resolution 22-13. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask Council Clerk Forrest to take a vote on the passage. Councilwoman Yanatuno. I'm sorry, uh, first we do have an emergency. Oh, that's right, we do, yes. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Council Clerk Forrest to take a vote on the emergency. Council Member Yanatuno. Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard. Yes. Perkins? Yes. Perry? Yes. Gillig? Yes. Emergency passes by a vote of six to zero. Please take a vote on the passage. Council member Yanatuno? Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Perry? Yes. And Gillig? Yes. Resolution 22-13 passes by a vote of six to zero. Resolution number 22-16 introduced by Steve Leppard. Resolution expressing appreciation to Dennis J. Eberly for his service to the city of Tiffin as a member and chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Whereas Dennis J. Eberly served as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals for almost 32 years, most assuredly the longest serving member of that board in the history of the city. And whereas Mr. Eberly brought his keen legal mind to his duties on the board and always fairly and reasonably applied the law. And whereas Mr. Eberly's commitment to the Tiffin community will serve as an example to others for generations. The council of the city of Tiffin therefore resolved section one, the city council of the city of Tiffin publicly expresses its sincere appreciation to Dennis J. Eberly for his outstanding service to the city of Tiffin and thanks him and his family for unselfishly giving of his time and talents for the betterment of the city. Section two, the clerk of council is hereby directed to provide a certified copy of this resolution to Dennis J. Eberly and the Zoning Board of Appeals. That is the first and only reading of resolution 22-16. Can we have a motion for passage? Councilman Leopard. Uh, I would ask for passage of resolution number 22-16. We have a motion for passage of resolution 22-16. Do we have a second? Council member Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll second that motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second for approval and passage of resolution 22-16. Is there any discussion? Law Director Howard. Yeah, if I may, um, because this uh, shouldn't pass with just a quick vote on something like uh, like Dennis's service. I mean, think about the, the amount of hours that Dennis has uh, voluntarily provided the city and, and our community over the 30 plus years that he has served. And one thing I want to note in particular is that um, because of Dennis's 
uh, service. And in particular, the way he has handled the meetings, um, he's been very fair to everyone who um, presents uh, uh, the issues before the, the Zoning Board of Appeals. He is always consistent with his decisions. Um, he is accurate in applying the law to the facts that are presented at hearings. And the result of that has been that we has, as a city, we've had very few appeals of the Zoning Board of Appeals to our local common police court, which has saved uh, a lot of time and resources for not only the city, but community members. And I think that that is a testament to uh, his ability to properly run and convene that the Zoning Board of Appeals for so long. So I wanna personally thank Dennis for his service. If I may add, uh, my father spent 18 years on the Zoning Board of Appeals with Mr. Eberly. And, you know, my, my I love my dad, but my dad was a, was a guy who, you know, he believed in what he believed. And, you know, sometimes, could not be convinced to the contrary, even if he was wrong. But I, I will say that whatever Mr. Eberly said, you know, that that word was about as good as gold with my dad. So even though I haven't had as many dealings with him as, as my folks have, I, I just know that the service he provided was absolutely invaluable to the city. Any further questions or comments? Councilman Leppard. <laughs> several of his committee meetings and boy i tell you what he runs a very very fine meeting and uh uh dennis is dennis is a great person you have to boot and uh, uh i've always i've always reminded dennis of this he's the only attorney i know that owns property on shady lane <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding. It's true. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask Council Clerk Forrest to take a vote on the passage of Resolution 22 16. Council Member Yanatuno? Yes. Councilman Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Perry? Yes. And Gillig? Yes. Resolution 22-16 is approved by a vote of six to zero with the sincere gratitude of city council. We'll now move on to ordinances. Ordinance number 22-34 introduced by Zach Perkins. Ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept an easement for sanitary sewer purposes from AAI Leasing LLC on four parcels of land off of Elwood and Davis streets and declaring an emergency. That is the second reading of ordinance 22-34. Ordinance number 22-35. Introduced by Zach Perkins, ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept an easement for sanitary sewer and stormwater drainage purposes from RNL Zeiss Family Partnership 3 Limited on land on Euclid Avenue and declaring an emergency. That is the second reading of ordinance 22-35. Ordinance number 22-36, introduced by Ben Gillig. Ordinance amending 2022 budget ordinance 21-105 to appropriate $2,371 into the park and recreation budget. That is the second reading of ordinance 22-36. Ordinance number 22-37, introduced by Steve Leppard. Ordinance authorizing the mayor and or Tiffin Seneca Economic Partnership to apply to and receive from the Ohio Department of Development Office of Community Development for a small city's community development block grant for qualifying projects and allowable administrative expenses, authorizing bidding and executing of contracts as needed and declaring an emergency. That is the first reading of ordinance 22-37. Ordinance number 22-38, introduced by Ben Gillig. Ordinance amending 2022 budget ordinance 21-105 to appropriate $3,200 into the city hall budget to pay the water bill for the remainder of the year. That is the first reading of ordinance 
And for those who are not watching along during uh, the Committee of the Whole meeting, uh, as is generally the case, uh, the smallest issue caused the biggest problem. A, a leaky toilet has uh, thrown the budget uh, out of proportion, which uh, will need to be addressed. Is there anybody from the council member, Iana Tuno? Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask for the suspension of the three reading rule and to ask for immediate passage of ordinance 22-38. Thank you. We have a motion for suspension of our three reading rule and immediate passage of ordinance 22-38. Is there a second? Councilman Leopard. I'll second the motion, Mr. President. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to pass ordinance 22-38. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I was listening in the committee of the whole and a water leak and $3,200 sounds like a lot of dollars to me. And then President Gilling just mentioned a leaky toilet. It, it's got to be more than a leaky toilet for $3,200. I, before I vote to okay this, I'd like a little further explanation, I guess. No, that certainly makes sense. Uh, Finance Director Kaufman, would you mind... Sure, it, it, you wouldn't think that it would add up to a lot, but it really does. Um, <coughs> gallons of water used went from 5,000 to 15,000. So it was significant um, for that toilet running and um, it was averaging over $400 a month. So um, just to get through the remaining eight months, that's why we put in $3,200. And if it, if it comes to the point where we don't need it, we can always return that to the general fund, correct? Yes, it can be reduced if we don't need it all. Perfect. Uh, Council Member Jones. Thank you, Councilman Friends. I hope the community doesn't take this wrong and I'm not pointing fingers, but I guess in my household, if a toilet was running for four to five to six months, wouldn't someone have noticed that and brought it up before now, I guess. I'm, it just $3,200 for water just sounds astronomical for lack of a better adjective. No, and, and that, that's an understandable sentiment, but you know, it seems that someone did notice, uh, you know, and it, it could have been much worse. Uh, City Administrator Thornton. I, I would just point out that the $3,200 isn't for that one leak. That's to increase the budget for our entire year. So it's 12 months that we're looking at in terms of that $3,200. You would be amazed at how many toilet leaks I see in the sewer department with people coming in for exceptions to their sewer bill because they have leaks of that magnitude. Some of them going on for five, six, seven months. So it does happen in the households as well. But this $3,200 is to help cover the budget for the entire year, not for that one leak. Okay, thank you. No, those, those are excellent questions, Council Member Jones. Uh, I remember when Aaron and I first moved uh, from above Bear Brothers to our house on North Washington Street, our first couple of water bills were $400 and we, we'd never paid a water bill before. So we thought, oh gee, you know, that's gonna be a huge part of our budget and leaky toilet. And we just, we didn't know any better until we called a plumber and. He's like, hey, guys, you might want to fix this. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, to put it in perspective, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I went away for just an extended weekend for only three or four days, and the little latch, the last time flushing the toilet going out the window got stuck. My toilet ran for three, maybe four days straight, and it added like $250 to my bill just from a three or four day nonstop run. So I see how this leaky toilet added up because it was in a not all that often used restroom. Um, the toilet's been replaced. That's the good news, but uh, we still got a bill to deal with. Maybe I need to take a break and go check my toilet here. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we all do. Council Member Leopard. As a longtime water company employee, that your best bet is to keep some food coloring in your medicine cabinet. That's the best way to check for a toilet leak. Put it in your tank, let it sit, come back in a half an hour. If you got 
toilet bowl that's red or blue or whatever, you know your toilet is waiting. If the uh, if the paper is listening in, can that be a full feature article? Because I think that be <laughs> that would be extraordinarily helpful information, especially for you know twenty nine year old me paying four hundred dollars for a water bill. Oh, very good. Um, I'll ask the clerk to call a uh, vote on the suspension for Ordinance twenty two dash thirty eight. Councilmember Yanachuno. Yes. Jones. Yes. Leopard. Yes. Perkins? Yes. Perry? Yes. And Gillig? Yes. Suspension passes by a vote of six to zero. Please take a vote on the passage. Council member Yanachuno? Yes. Jones? Um, yes. Councilman Leopard? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Perry? Yes. And Gillig? Yes. Ordinance 22-38 is approved by a vote of 6-0. That concludes the ordinances, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Clerk Torres. Is there any other business that needs to come before Council this evening? Council Member Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. More of a side issue. Uh, several people have asked me about the playground equipment at the Nature Trails Park. I heard from a reliable source, what is there is what it's gonna be. And a question came up and it was a very good one. And this stems from the School of Opportunity donating their equipment to Bettsville Park area, I believe. If we're replacing the playground equipment at Hedges Boyer Park with the, and I don't know what word, all inclusive, what's gonna to happen to that current playground equipment? See, more specific, uh, can it go to Nature Trails Park, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Well, that's an awesome question, because I just asked Bryce if I could buy the old monkey bars from Oakley Park on Gov Deals. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, the equipment that can be salvaged is going to be salvaged. However, most of the equipment that is over 20 years old is just not in good enough condition to survive the move. Uh, part of the problem is uh, the larger structures are actually sunk several feet into the ground into concrete and they have to saw them off to even get them out, uh, which then makes them essentially unusable, but they are going to salvage what they can to incorporate into other parks. Thank you. Very good, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else? As a final thought this evening, I would like to uh, invite all of you to take part in the Memorial Day festivities here in the city of Tiffin. We will have our parade and then there will be a ceremony on Frost Parkway. Uh, Frost Parkway has been closed off. The Tiffin Columbian Band will be playing. Um, General Scheid is going to speak. And then earlier today, I was fortunate enough to speak with Sandra Best and Sandra is involved with the Fort Stevenson chapter of the Daughters of the War of 1812. And there's also a Sons chapter and they're kind of interested in helping folks trace their lineage back to those who served uh, in what's really almost a forgotten war in American history. And they are going to be presenting a beautiful wreath uh, at the ceremony to go along with the honor guard and uh, remarks from other officials. So we'd certainly be um, more than honored if uh, all the good folks watching and all of you good folks on council and, and city leadership would, uh, would consider attending. Very good. Uh, seeing no other hands up, I wanna thank everybody for their time and their service and their patience this, patience this evening. And we will declare the meeting adjourned at 8.33 p.m. Good night, everybody. See you guys. Yeah.